Mi senti? Yes, let's start. Oh. Here we go. Okay, guys. North of Italy, Lombardy is this region, just looking at my pointer. Um, what you see here, I like it in orange, is basically the province of Brescia, because the Franciacorta wine region is all in the province of uh, Brescia, which is one of the provinces uh, in uh, Lombardy. Let's just zoom in a bit. Here, on the right, we can see the Valpolicella area. So basically, if we use our lovely ruler, uh, just to give you an idea, from Franciacorta to Sperry, is basically 44, 45 miles. And also the distance from uh, Fergettina to Milano is around, again, 40 miles. And here around uh, the Franciacorta wine region, we have the Lake Garda, which is around 28 miles. And the Lago Iseo is basically there, just on the northern part of uh, uh, the Franciacorta wine uh, region. If we keep zooming in, Okay, here we see the Franciacorta wine region, which is basically 19 communes in the province of Brescia. The difference only in color between the yellow and the purple is just because the purple ones, the communes where you see the purple ones is where Fergettina has its own uh, vineyards. Laura, could you give us some information about the Franciacorta wine region, please? Yeah, for sure, first of all, Buongiorno o buonasera a tutti. Uh, good afternoon or good morning to everybody. And thanks for inviting me to this uh, uh, seminar. And um, just a few words about the, the wine area. As, Gaeta as Gaetano said, um, the Francia Corta uh, uh, is in Lombardy, so in the north of Italy. And the, the wine region has three natural borders on four. On the north, the Iseo Lake. Uh, on the south part, uh, the border is a small mountain called Monte Orfano. That means um, Orphan Mountain because he is down there alone. Um, the west border is a river called the Fiume Olio that goes out from the lake and then joins the Fiume Po, that is the biggest river in Italy. And the east border is the only one um, that, that is not natural, but is the border um, due to the uh, commune's part of the region. And the Franciacorta is a quite small wine region. And even if it's small, this is the main uh, wine region for the production of sparkling in Italy. We can compare the Franciacorta wine region with the Champagne region, just to give you an idea of our size. So in Franciacorta, we totally count 3,000 hectares of vines. In Champagne, they have something like 35,000. So we are very, very small compared to them. But for Italy, we are the main area. All over the Italy, there's the production of sparkling. And all over Italy, they are called spumante, except the area where they call it prosecco. But prosecco is not produced like champagne method, so with secondary fermentation into the bottle. Only in wine re in our region, the name of the wine is Francia Corta. So, in one word, we mean wine area, wine, and method of production. The Main variety we grow here are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and then are the two variety, varieties that are grown in very small uh, quantity that are, that are Pinot Bianco and the new uh, variety called Erba Mat that are still in study. So we are still studying on this variety. Our soils are um, from Mor Morainic origin, so a glacier in the Ice Age coming from the north, from the Alps, arrived in the area. And during his trip from the mountain to here, 
this glacier get a lot of different stones and soils. And when the glacier starts to dissolve to create the lake, that is actually our north border, he left these stones and soil random uh, on, on our area. The, the main part where we find uh, these stones and soils is the central part inside the moraine, moraine amphitheater with the blue, you can see this shape on the blue line that uh, Gaetano is moving the mouse. And outside this area, there is also uh, good, good, good soils for the viticulture, but with different origin, arriving to the southeast part of the region where the Monte Orfano, uh, the, the north part of the Monte Orfano is still Franciacorta. On the south, start the Pianura Padana, so the flat area where it's not possible to grow grapes, not for good wines at least. <laughs> <laughs> and which is also, Laura, we can uh, better also identify the different in soils so between, uh, thanks to yeah. this now. This map, this map represents a study of zoning uh, done at the beginning of the 90s by the Consorzio Franciacorta. And the idea was to study the different soils and to see how these soils can um, give different characteristics to the wines. So the different colors represent different soils and different characteristics on the soil and on the wines and vines we can grow on these soils. So as you can see, it's very um, mixed. The, the soils are very mixed one mm, to the other. And our winery grow grapes in all the different kinds of soils except the eastern part where you can see the purple uh, colors. Because the Amphitheatro Morenico, the Morenic Amphitheater is this area, no? Yeah, exactly. The yellow sign, yellow and red, uh, is the border of the Morenic Amphitheater, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the biggest part of our vineyards are in this area. We also have some vineyards in the southeast part of the region, in the communes of uh, Cologne and Coccaglio, so on the southeast part of the, of the Monte Orfano. But the biggest uh, amount of vineyards are inside the uh, Which is the total uh, number of hectares you have? Uh, we run 200 hectares divided in 11 different villages or municipalities. I don't know. Which is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the 70 percent it's within. Uh, yeah, exactly. In the in central the area of, of Franciacorta, exactly. And on these vineyards we have uh, more or less uh, 130 hectares of Chardonnay and 70 of Pinot Noir, just a couple of Pinot Bianco and 7,000 square meter of uh, Herba Mat, the new variety we are studying. Mm -hmm. and and, uh, Pinot Nero, it had a specific uh, uh, location or not? Where it yeah, was? We, um, just to give you an idea, we can grow a good Chardonnay almost everywhere. I mean, the variety Chardonnay is very versatile and it can grow, giving us good uh, wines almost everywhere in the Franciacorta area. The Pinot Noir is a little bit more, um, come si dice capriccioso? <laughs> Let's say difficult. <laughs> yeah, we can say difficult to grow. So before planting a vineyards of Pinot Noir, we must do a lot of studies and select the right exposure for the vineyard, the right soil, the altitude. So we are, I think, one of the winery with the biggest amount of Pinot Noir in Franciacorta. And uh, we love to fight with this grape variety to obtain good, uh, good grapes. So we have tried to plant these vines in very different area to compare the different results we can obtain. We use Pinot Noir for um, three Franciacorta. Each one of these Franciacorta need Pinot Noir with different characteristics. So we have some Pinot Noir in the eastern part, very delicate and elegant. Some Pinot Noir in the southeast part of the area, a little bit more stronger and powerful. And uh, some Pinot Noir inside the Morenic Amphitheater, very with a rich varietal 
tasting. And we use this Pinot Noir for the rosé, for example. Yeah. And there is any difference on the age of the vines? Yeah, so we are a quite young winery. So next year we will have our 30th birthday. And my father created the winery in 1991. When started with Ferdettina, my papa uh, didn't have any land, any building. So we rented a few hectares of vineyard in Erbusco, our town, and also the building where we had our uh, first winery. Mm -hmm. And this building it was based on a small piece of land called Fergettina. That's why our name, because our surname is not Fergettina. And so we started renting a um, vineyard also um, already existing. So uh, it was a 15 years old vineyard. That, and we used this vineyard for the first three, four harvests. And then my father started to plant new vineyards. So uh, we don't own all the land uh, that we have mm -hmm. because the land is very expensive. And as we started from nothing 30 years ago, it, for us it's not possible to buy all the vineyards we have. But in the area, there's a lot of people that own land, but they don't work with this land. So it's very common that these people rent to the wineries, the soil, that they, they the land and we do the plantation of vines. So in this year, starting from 1994, we continue to plant new vineyards. So every year, almost every year, we plant or we replant new vineyards. So the oldest vines we have now are 42 years old and we have the new one planted one week ago. So a very wide variety of characteristic, also because the the year of our vineyards. But let me tell you that uh, we don't use any grape for any Franciacorta, at least um, until they did five harvests. Okay. I mean, if we plant today, that's May 2020. We can get the first bunches in 2024, but we don't use these grapes until 2029. Okay. Because to produce a sparkling that must be aged long time, we must wait that the grapes are um, with a sort of uh, identity, with a sort of character they have, and they need time to get this balance and to grow good, good grapes. And Laura, I remember uh, um, there were some difference or some uh, more details about this, the vineyards in these three areas, no? Yeah, yeah, I, um, I, we talk about the vineyards inside the Moraine, Moraine Amphitheater that are the best part of the region. But uh, as we are so lucky to grow our grapes in so many different places, I've tried to, to give you an idea of the more particular vineyards we have. So in the eastern part where you can read Camignone, mm -hmm. we have uh, some vineyards planted with Chardonnay and one, only one with Pinot Noir. This is the um, more um, cold area. So we can harvest the, these grapes later on almost at the end of August with a perfect ripen and a perfect and still very, very high acidity and low pH. So these vineyards are very important in the blend of the cuvee for our Franciacorta because they allow us to have always a perfect freshness. Then we have a lot, some vineyards, only Chardonnay in the southest part, close to the mountain, um, in the northern part of the mountain. This one? And these vineyards, as the soils there, are a little bit more fertile. Si dice fertili? Yeah. Okay, fertile. Sorry, <laughs> my English is terrible. And um, these vineyards help us to give power to the blend. 
And then since 10 years, we also, uh, we've also planted a couple of vineyards of uh, Pinot Noir in the southern side of the mountain. And these grapes are so unique because the soils there are very, very unique. I mean, when you walk there, it seems to be uh, to, to be walking su Marte on <laughs> Mars. The soils are red, completely red, and there's white stones, so it's unique. And the Pinot Noir there um, is ripened normally three weeks before the rest of the area. So we harvest the first week of uh, August, always, giving us a rich and fruity uh, varietal taste. So again, another uh, characteristic. It seems to be the highest post, uh, point in uh, elevation for the vineyard. I mean, here, it, the, um, the altitude here is around uh, 300 meters. It seems to be the it's highest point. 150. The highest vineyard in Franciacorta, where we have the vineyard, is around 300 exactly. The winery is three, 290 meters where we are. Mm. Yeah. And um, on, on our 200 hectares, we select 100 for the production of our wines. And we sell the rest of the grapes to another winery in the region. So 80% of our efforts in terms of uh, energy, economical and of human work is to grow our grapes. So first of all, we are a, um, agriculture, we are farmer. And starting from there, we build the rest of our job. So we do a lot of efforts because all these hectares are um, runs with um, uh, organic. Uh, agriculture and it's not easy to be organic in Franciacorta because we are in the north of Italy I mean cold during winter time and during summer time we have especially in the last few years very extreme events so uh, very strong storms hail and uh, it's not easy but we believe a lot in our job and ex especially in our uh, land. So we live here, everybody of our family lives here and we want to try to keep this land uh, healthy and nice as it is now. So we don't print on our labels that we are organic. We are a little bit crazy because, because it's not easy and we don't, we, we don't tell to anybody that we are organic but it's really for a matter of philosophy and respect of uh, where we are, where we live and where we work, for sure. So after the selection of our 100 wine, uh, vineyards, from these 100 vineyards, we obtain around 90 different wines that give us seven Franciacorta. So every Franciacorta has an identity, a specific identity, coming from the unique identity that we have in our soils and vineyards. So, and the organic, uh, let's say, certification, even if it's not in the bottle, it's not only for the vineyards, it's also for the winery, no? Excuse me, Gaetano, can you repeat? Because... The organic certification, what we were talking before about the vineyards, yeah. it's yeah. also, let's say, certification for the winery, no? Yeah, the, the winery, yeah, also the winery is uh, organic certificate. But uh, so all the process follow the organic rules. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, just to finish with, with the vineyards, uh, is the Guyot training system, no? The one that you have. Yeah, yeah. we only have three vineyards. The oldest one with the Cordone Speronato or Silvo. So an old uh, way to grow grapes, especially the Silvo. But all the other ones are uh, Guyot, exactly. And the maximum production per vine is two kilos. It means uh, four small bunches, very small. And the, the, um, every hectare has 5,000 vines. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Laura, if you want, we can move to the... No, let's wait, that maybe there is a question here. Ah, what is the origin of the name Franciacorta? Grazie Enrico. <laughs> uh, so, Franciacorta um, has this wine history uh, very far in the past, has started his history very, very long time ago. I mean, in the area, we found some uh, Ammazza di Enrico. Eh? <laughs> we found some, <laughs> some uh, prehistoric uh, stones with seeds of grapes. So very, very long time ago. But the name wasn't Franciacorta. Uh, Franciacorta doesn't mean little, that doesn't mean little France, not at all. But you have to know that as we are in south, in the southest part of a lake, in the past, around uh, uh, in the 11th century, uh, the biggest part of this area was covered by water, especially the northern part of the area, the water coming from the, la the lake. So this area was not good for uh, agriculture purpose. And in the area, there's a lot of monasteries. Yes. Yeah. Monastery. Ah, sì. Capisco, non ti preoccupare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the monks were in charge to um, clean the land from the water to let people do uh, farming or cultivate vines or uh, corn or to, to live there. So the owner of the municipalities, of the communes, to say thank you to the monks, allow them to don't pay taxes. In Latin, what we could say today, duty-free, because it was a duty-free area. In Latin, we call it Curtes Franche, so area where you don't have to pay taxes. It was in the past, now we have to pay taxes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so this area, all this area was a duty-free area, a Curtes Franche area, a Curtes Franche area, and from Latin to Italian, the translation on the evolution of the name was Franciacorta. Perfetta, Laura. Grazie. <laughs> Uh, Laura, here is the beginning of the uh, vinification for uh, Francia Corta. Yeah. I have also a question from Taylor, which is actually on point, uh, given the, the, what we are going to do. Erba Mat. Erba Mat. Yeah. Uh, as you know, we are, we are living in, a, in, the air, in, the a, in the years of the global warming. And when I was young, uh, when, so let's say a lot of years ago, uh, we did our harvest uh, at the beginning of September. And now to have the same characteristic on our wines, we do harvest at the beginning of August. So in 20, more or less 20 years, uh, 25, <laughs> we had reduced the time of ripening of the grape of one month. So we must be ready to follow this changing and we have to guarantee to the consumer and also to us the same characteristic in our wine. And the main problem is the freshness because when you have um, hot season, hot summertime, the risk is to lose the acidity. And the acidity for a French Corta or general, speaking in general, uh, for a sparkling is very important to this, to give freshness, freshness, drinkability and long aging, long potential aging. Herbamat was a um, traditional variety of the area, forgot for a lot of time, a lot of years. But Erbamat now, it's very important, is a 
potential grape for the future because now we harvest the herbamat at the end of October and sometimes sometimes it's not ripened enough. I told you before that we need a lot of years before being ready with a vineyard for a sparkling. But we have to start now to do some studies to be ready maybe in 20 years to, to, to be able to give to the customer the same Franciacorta as we are drinking now, even if the weather and the climate continue to change. The Herba Mat has a very neutral taste, but it, it has a very high acidity. That's the purpose of these studies. At the moment, if you produce a wine, a Franciacorta using Herba Mat, you can't call it Franciacorta, but only Spumante, because it's still in study. So it's like uh, university studies and experiment studies. But the future is for sure to follow this way and, uh, and maybe use it in higher percentage compared to now. Yeah, because what you told me is actually that when now you harvest the Herbamat, you give all the grapes to the Franciacorta Consortium, no? Yeah, to study the evolution the of, the grape, of the taste and the potential aging and so on, yeah. The amount we grow is really less than one hectare. So at the moment we prefer to help the consortium that get the grapes from, from the wineries to study instead of use for our production. It, 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 it's helpful, helpful for all the area and so we, we go on this direction. Mm. Okay. What else? Should we start from uh, what we see? Yeah, so a small uh, picture about what we do to produce our Franciacorta. The only method allowed is the, the one with the secondary fermentation into the bottle. But our uh, consortium um, follow us in all the steps of the production, starting from plantation of vines, arriving to the moment where we harvest. And the harvest must be done by end, in small cases, to be sure to arrive at the press process with the bunches in perfect condition. As I told you, we normally are harvest at the beginning of August, maximum around 10, 12 of August. It depends on the season, but normally it's the first week of the month. The bunches are pressed uh, in the same day of harvest, so fresh uh, fruit. And we press in a very gentle way using pneumatic press for the Chardonnay, and we use a marmonier for all the Pinot Noir we press. From the pressing, we obtain three different uh, kinds of juice. The first quality that we use for the Franciacorta, because by law we can obtain from 10 kilos, or let's say 100 kilos, 65 hectoliters of Franciacorta but we have decided to, to use only 30 for our Franciacorta and the rest of the wine, second and third selection are sold like uh, still wine. Mm -hmm. So another selection. The first one is in the vineyard where we select 100 hectares for our production and we sell the rest of the grapes. The second very important selection is here during harvest time. When, where we have decided to use only the flower juice, so the best part of every berry for the Franciacorta, and the rest is Curte Franca, the steel wine. Mm -hmm. So from this juice, we do the first fermentation to go from a juice to a wine. The steel wines are aged during winter time in stainless steel tanks. And now we are doing the tirage, so the bottling, for secondary fermentation into the bottle. Before the tirage, we do another very important uh, job, that is the blending, so the preparation of the different cuvee. So we taste uh, all our 100 wines coming from the different vineyards, and we select every Chardonnay and every Pinot Noir to produce a specific, specific Franciacorta, I mean, 
The Chardonnay we use for our Francia Corta Satin is never used for the Milady and never for the Brut. So our Francia Corta, even where they are still wines before mm -hmm. secondary fermentation, are different one from the other because, because they come from different vineyards, different variety and different area of the Francia Corta. After the creation of the cuvée, this is the job we are doing in these days, we do the bottling. So we add sugar and leaves to the still wines to have the secondary fermentation. So to create the bubbles in our Francia Corta. The bottles during the secondary fermentation are stored horizontally. The fermentation lasts about two weeks. And at the end of the fermentation, there's no more sugar in the wine. And there's millions of bubbles. <laughs> that uh, are four atmosphere and a half, maximum five for the satin, and uh, uh, normally six for all the other Francia Corta. In this position, so horizontal uh, bottles, wine and yeast inside, we age our Francia Corta from 36 months to 84. The one you are reading now, the aging period, is the minimum required by law. But since three years, we have increased the minimum. So even the Francia Corta Brut, the non-vintage, the regular Brut, is aged um, 36 months instead of 18. So the double than the minimum. After the long time of aging, uh, before uh, sharing a glass of Francia Corta, we have to clean the bottles from the yeast and uh, um, change the cork. So we do the remuage, the riddling, to move the yeast from the body to the neck of the bottle. Once the yeast are on the top of the bottle, in the small part of the neck, we do the uh, disgorgement. I mean, we, we freeze the neck of the bottle with all the yeast inside, we open the bottle and the pressure inside eliminate in less than one second all the yeast. And so we've changed the cork, the wine is clean. We put the dosage to have the different kind of Francia Corta about sugar level. You can see the different name here. So Padose or zero dosage up to three grams per liter of sugar, up to six is the extra brute, and up to 12 is the brute. So we do only the brute as a, so we do only three kind of uh, Francia Corta, the zero dosage, the extra brute and the brute. We don't do any sweet Francia Corta. After the dosage, we close again the bottle with the mushroom shaped cork, and after a lot of analysis and controls from the consortium and the official offices that uh, give us the authorization. We obtain the French Corta DOCG label and we can start to open and drink. <laughs> <laughs> and we obtain those. Yeah, this is the French Corta. Uh, Fascetta DOCG, DOCG label, yeah. Uh, do you see now your lineup, Laura? Sorry? Vedi le bottiglie? No. Ok. Vedo te. Che non è male comunque. Ora però vedi le bottiglie. Ora sì, ora sì. Uh, and Laura, before that we were talking about uh, how to make a Francia Corta. Um, there is, I mean, the square bottle is also beautiful, but it's, but it's also useful in the process, no? Yeah, exactly. Um, just to explain you a little bit about the history of this bottle. Um, it was invented by my brother, Matteo. Um, he was finishing his university studies in 2011. And uh, in 2007, six and seven, honestly, he started to think about a new, uh, a new uh, bottle 
that will, that should be nice to see, different from the other, but mainly that could help us to give something special to the quality of the wine. So I started to study about this uh, bottle together with the glass producers. And the final result was this square bottle. And uh, part of the aesthetical reason behind this bottle, there's mainly a technical reason because the square base gives us flat sides. And during the aging of the bottles with the lees, as you saw in the uh, picture before, Mm -hmm. After the second fermentation, when the yeast fell down, they have, they can cover all the flat side of the bottle, that is a big triangle, two times and a half bigger compared to the space we have in a round bottle. So thanks to this bigger surface of contact between yeast and wine, we can have more um, opalises, more complexity on the wine, and the aging uh, on this bottle give more um, quality to the product. At the beginning, it was so only a sort of experiment. So after the thesis, when we studied the technical differences, we've started to bottle two wines in this bottle, the Milady, that's a Chardonnay 100%, and the Rosé. And starting from, from last year, with the harvest 2015, mm -hmm. we've also added the satin in the square base bottle with a dark glass. And in the next years, all the line will be in the square bottle except the brut. So the idea is to um, uh, put all the vintages Franciacorta in the square bottle and the non-vintage in the regular one. Perfetto. Um, Laura, sì. you that now we see almost all the line up because there is, there is not the extra brut. Ah, sì, forse era meglio mettere l'extra brut uh, al posto di ero nero. Va bene, non importa. No, no, ero nero è importante. What are the main differences say, among these wines? Uh, uh, which are the, the main differences among these wines? I mean, so first of all, as I told you, the main difference is that every French Porta comes from different grapes. This, this is the biggest difference on the, on the taste. So at the beginning, we want that every wine has its identity. So the first selection is on the grapes we use. And then every wine has different tastes coming from the different time of aging on these and the different dosage. Uh, and the, the, yeah, and, and the um, cuvee between the different varieties we have in each one. Would you like I tell you something about every Franciacorta? Yeah. Allora, uh, starting with the Franciacorta Brut, that is the Franciacorta that we started to produce when my father created the winery. So this is sort of business card for us. Everybody that comes here to visit us never leave the winery without tasting a glass of Franciacorta Brut. So very important for us. Here we blend together grapes coming from around 55 different vineyards, 55 to 65. So this wine represent us, represent the winery, and represent also very well the area because the vineyards come from 11 different villages. Uh, the grapes here are 85% Chardonnay and 15% Pinot Noir. The Francia Corta Brut, even if it is non-vintage, is made only with grapes coming from a single harvest. And the aging on these is three years. As about the sugar added at the disgorgement is around five grams per liter. The total yearly production is around 2,800 bottles. So half of our production is for the Francia Corta Brut. That is also the only one produced in the, all the sizes of bottles, starting from the half, arriving to the nine liters. Then we have the Mille D, 
Mille di means a thousand days in Italiano, that's three years, and that's the, the time of aging of this wine, that's a Chardonnay 100% on this. The first production for Mille di was harvest 2007 in the square base bottle. And we blend together 15 different, 15 to 20 different vineyards to, of Chardonnay to produce this wine that is again a brut, but drier compared to the non-vintage because here we have four grams per liter of sugar. Then we have the Franciacorta Satin that arrived on our range for the first time with harvest 1996. It was in the regular bottle until last year, now in the square base. And as I told you before, all over Italy, there's the production of sparkling. All over Italy, these wines are called Spumante. Only here, we call them Franciacorta. And only in Franciacorta, we are allowed to produce Satin. So this wine is strictly connected with the area because only here we can do this wine. Satin is a fantasy name that wants to remember the silk because um, basically the Satin has uh, three rules that make this wine different from the other, Francia Corta. The first one is that it must be a Blonde de Blanc, so no Pinot Noir allowed. The second one is that it must be a Brut, about sugar level. And the third one is that the pressure at the end of the secondary fermentation, fermentation must be lower compared to the other Francia Corta. Lower pressure means lower amount of bubble, so the foam is very creamy, very delicate, very silky, very elegant. And these are the characteristics of the satin. We do a vintage satin, again with 36 months of aging on this, a little bit more than 36, and uh, uh, only Chardonnay, 100%. And for sure, as I told you, we use different Chardonnay compared to the one we use for the Mille di. Then we have uh, the Rosé, that is 100% Pinot Noir. The Pinot Noir grapes we use for the Rosé comes from the vineyards inside the Moreni Amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is again a Brut, but very dry, like the Mille di with 4 grams per liter of sugar. And uh, by law, the um, Rosé must have minimum 25% of Pinot Noir, but as we love this grape, we have decided to do 100% Pinot Noir. It's not easy, but we work a lot on the quality of this grape, so we go ahead in this direction. We have a special selection called Eronero, that is a sort of uh, yeah, limited edition of the best harvest of Pinot Noir that we do only when the season is perfect. And these, the vineyards we use for this wine are only two. So very, very selected. Uh, this wine is like, uh, if you smell the wine without look at the glass, you can think you are drinking a red because the varietal um, smell of the Pinot Noir is very strong. Then when you drink it, you have the perception of the freshness and drinkability of a Francia Corta. So it's a very, very interesting mix. And at the end of the range, there's the Reserva 33, Reserva 33. <laughs> and this wine is a blend of a blend because our three best white cuvée, so, the base wine that we use for the production of Mille di, Satin and Extra Brut, one third each, are blended together on a second blend. So one third means 33%. Blended together, bottled, eight years of aging on this, and then at the disgorgement, no dosage. So it's a pas dosé or zero dosage. A very small production, but also very, very interesting with long, long potential aging. And that's all. Thank you, Laura. It's not all because we also have 
The New Mini, no? Eh, sì, sì. Ce l'ho qua, eh? Ta -da! Ah, aspetta che non la vedono. Eh no. Loro non vedono me? Adesso sì. Allora me le metto qua, così vedono la misura. Così non so se vedono me. Come faccio a saperlo? Alza un po', alza un po' le bottiglie. Sì, così. Le vedete? Can you see the small one? The cute small half square bottle. <laughs> Available for all the... You can see what's in this, the screen. Yeah. Both me and Satan and Rosé. Sì. Yeah, we started a small production last December. The idea was to show the wines at Vin Italy, but yeah, no Vin Italy and no show. <laughs> uh, okay, there is Conroy question. How would you describe your house style versus other styles? Thank you, Mike, for your question. Um, it's not easy, especially in English, to explain you, but uh, let me tell you that uh, we try to, I, I told you again before, that we have a deep respect on our land and the potential, uh, the, the characteristic of the soil, the grape, we are farmer. So our wines are simply made with grapes, nothing else. I mean, the biggest part of our job is to grow the grapes. When we arrive at the winery, we only use the, the first quality coming from the berries. And then we simply have to blend them together to do a sort of puzzle that is perfect, that, that do a perfect picture and simply wait that, that this picture age on, on the best way, so perfect condition, storage condition, and nothing else. The wines must be the fruit of the fruit. I mean, nothing that we can do to change the characteristic of the grapes. We don't add any secret potion at the disgorgement because all the liqueur of the dosage, so the wine we use to fill in the bottle after the disgorgement, is made with the same wine we have into the bottle. We don't add nothing else. Again, to respect the, the, the work we, do, we did at the beginning. And as about the tasting characteristic, our wines, we want that our wines are clean, elegant and delicate. Maybe in a blind tasting, they don't... Come si dice emergere? Come they out? Come? Come out? They don't come out because they are very delicate. But then, at the end, all the glasses are empty. And this is very important. In a sparkling, you, it doesn't mean to do simple wine or too easy. It means that there's a perfect balance between the elegance, the, the, the body, the structure, the sparkling, the acidity, and the aromas. So this is the, the, our philosophy. So respect of the area, of the soil, of the fruit, and wine that can be enjoyed by the people for, for his elegance and freshness. Even the, the Reserva 33, that is aged eight years, is very complex, very rich, but at the same time elegant and clean. We don't age our wines in wood, again, to give only space to the, to the fruit. Okay, Laura. Uh, actually, Laura, my fault, I missed to show the video. <gasps> no. <laughs> so we can do it. Let's we can enjoy the video now. Here we are. Ci voleva la musica. Vuoi, vuoi pure la musica? Sì, dai, fallo ripartire con la musica che segue il ritmo del, della stagione. Aspetta, aspetta.
No, dai, non voglio metterti in casino. Con te facciamo tutto, Laura. So, what do we see, Laura, here? Uh, we, we, see, we, are, we did this video for one year, so starting from uh, January last year to, to now, almost now. And here we can see all the steps in the vineyards, uh, the bud, the bunches, the verizon, the vineyards with the full leaves and the harvest by hand, grapes arriving at the winery, pinot noir bunches. Here is where we are. Here is where I am now. The fruit arriving at the winery, loaded case by case into pneumatic press for the Chardonnay and into the Marmonnier for the Pinot Noir. And soft, soft and slow pressure. The juice arrive at the winery for the fermentation into the stainless steel tank. Here is where we age our Purte Franca Rosso. This is what we are doing now, the tirage, so the bottling for the secondary fermentation, yeast, wine, and sugar, aging uh, horizontally, remuage, my papa, the check, the <laughs> bottles, and here the disgorgement. We freeze the neck, this is the small ice cube, we open the bottle, we add wine to fill in the bottle, mushroom shaped cork, cage, and then go to the label that is not done yet. So the video is not complete again because of the virus we can't finish, but anyway. And here is where we age all the bottles. This is our library. That's the meat idea. Mm -hmm. And Matteo, Laura, what does Matteo? What is his job? Matteo, his job is to be my brother. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. No, um, both my brother and me, we grow, we grew at the winery. So we are both enologists. And we follow all the steps of the production. He especially follow the winery, and me, I especially follow the vineyards. So now he's very busy with the bottling, and I'm following the vineyards outside. So he's now the winemaker together with my papa and me. And we are family winery, so we don't have a specific rules. We, we do everything. And that's very interesting because we can know everything about the job we are doing. And uh, as we always do every year, the same circle, the same job, but every season is completely different from the year before and from the year after. So it's very important to know what we do, every step to be ready for the next one you have to do. So very, very interesting. So Matteo now is in the wineries, mainly in the winery. Once he used to travel with me in the US to visit you, but now he's very lazy <laughs> and he doesn't want to take any plane no more. Donato, please invite my brother, you know, Maybe how? No, you don't want to see him. And, uh, I don't remember he was studying English, no? No, he doesn't want to study, doesn't want to fly. So I have to travel alone and we stay here at the winery. Talking about Donato, there is a question from him. It was uh, about the pressing, uh, Laura. Is yeah. there a maximum allowed from the consortio on yeah. the number of passage or pressing? Uh, the number of Juices or different kind of juice is not specific, is not um, uh, described, but the we have the maximum quantity of juice we can obtain from a hectare, and this is sixty five hectoliters. Uh, every winery can decide how many 
um, part of this juice, uh, in how many parts divide these uh, 65 hectoliters? I mean, you can do one press and arrive directly to 65. Mm -hmm. This is not a good idea, absolutely not. Because you have to imagine to have a berry in your finger. If you press the berry, the first part of juice that goes out, this is the first quality that represents the central part of every berry. And this is the one you obtain with the lower pressure. This is the best about fragrance, aroma, pH and acidity. And about our following our studies, this is maximum 30%, not 65. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have decided to use only this 30 for the Francia Corta and from 30 to 65 we do still wines. But the consortium don't uh, oblige us to do this. This is a decision of the winery. So basically, you do two pressing. One that you we go do through four. Ah, you we do, do four. four. The first one is for the Francia Corta. The second, from uh, yeah, it's a little bit complicated. But anyway, from zero to thirty is Francia Corta. From thirty to fifty is. Curte Franca, the still white wine. Then to arrive to 65, we sell table wine here at the winery for private consumers that comes to bottle it at home, a still white wine. And then the last one that helps us to dry the skins is sold to the distillery. Mm -hmm. This is not used here for nothing. And there is also a question from Fabio. Uh, he was saying that the, the video that we saw before, Laura, he, we saw a vine bleeding. Do you prefer having vines doing that? Non capito cos'è vine bleeding. Ho visto la goccia dell'acqua, so bleeding, no? Si piange. Piange. Yeah. So during winter time, the vines slip so at the end of, the, of october maybe beginning of november all the vines leave all the leaves and start to slip to recover the energy for the season for the next season the vines slip i mean there's no activity inside the the trees when the weather is warmer, it should be end February, maximum first, second week of March, a mosquito, sorry. Uh, the activity and the life of the vines start again because they feel the warm air and they are ready for the new season. From the cut we do uh, for the winter pruning, the vines start to cry. In Italiano we say piange, so the vines are crying. And the water you see is the lympha. That means here we are again ready and few days after the, uh, the bud start to grow and in one week we have the new leaves the new the first new leaves and then the season go go, go on yeah. yes but aren't you afraid that you can get are you afraid that you can get some sort of disease because the vine you know it's a fresh cut yeah no but the cut is very very small and uh, you can have disease, and this is uh, a problem, when you have to cut the, the tree. Sometimes it happens when you have the um, um, flavescenza dorata, sorry, I don't know in English, I don't have any idea, that is a disease coming from an insect, or some wood disease. When you have wood disease, you have to do spatial pruning and cut as low as you can the vine 
to have new um, trees coming outside from the, the main part. These big cuts are dangerous because you can have problem. So we have to cover this big cut with the, um, si chiama mastice da innesto o da potatura. I don't know in English, it's a special, a natural, like a cream to avoid this problem. But it's very rare, luckily. Is that, I don't want to get into the details, but the mastice is uh, with salt, it's, it's a sulfur based or is there are some other ingredients? No, it's like, um, Um, una specie di argilla viene fatta che è impermeabile I don't know if you can help me with the translation it's like a sand clay, clay paste clay paste, grazie, thank you uh, another question from uh, Mike why doesn't the consortio promote Satan more being so unique to Franciacorta no, we are doing we are uh, Just going back a few years in the past, at the beginning of 2000, Satin was on the top of all the wine guides, and very, with a high request. We sold out in that year, the Satin in three months instead of one year. So uh, it was very, very popular. Then the taste, Uh, of the Italian consumer, so I'm talking about Italy now, changed a little bit from a delicate wine to wine more acid and with no sugar. And even the wine guide in Italy started to give more importance to the uh, extra brut and zero dosage instead of satin. And this Um, last for about 10 years, so until 2020, 2011. Now, a lot of people is coming back to the Satin. A lot, is, a lot of people is discovering the potential of um, this wine that is also so unique, as Mike says. So even the consortia now, is working uh, to give more importance to this wine. Just to start, uh, we have decided to increase the minimum aging on this. So even if you do a non-vintage, the satin must be aged at least 24 months instead of 18. So we are working to increase the quality into the bottle. And at the same time, we are working, still working, to find the right way to promote this uh, connection, unique connection for this, between this wine and, the, and our wine area. I think we are not doing enough yet, but we are still working. So work in progress. We are, we are working, yeah. Okay. If you want to help us with some suggestion, <laughs> <laughs> why not? Any more question? Sembra di no, Laura. Mi fate andare a fare le nanne? <laughs> It seems so, Laura. Grazie. Grazie a voi. Thanks to you. I hope you had some new information and it was not too boring. <laughs> it was really nice. Grazie. Grazie, grazie. 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 Ciao, ciao a tutti. Grazie. Ciao Federica, ciao ciao. 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 Grazie, ciao ciao. Ciao, grazie. Ciao ciao, buona, buona giornata a voi. <ride> non andiamoci a dormire, va Laura. Eh sì, e a mangiare. Vabbè, ciao. Grazie, ciao ciao.